All right, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of Fatima, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, a little disclaimer uh, before we get started. I don't want you to think that this is original. I try very hard not to be original. Uh, basically, all my talks are just uh, glorified book reports. Sometimes I cite the things, but not always, because it's not an academic exercise, but it's not my work. Ave Maria Christum, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. In chapter 6 of the Gospel of St. Matthew, our Lord commands us to seek first the kingdom of God and his justice. Seek first the kingdom of God and his justice. We'll start today with a story about a man who, at least initially, not only did not obey this commandment, but actually failed miserably at it. A man who, at least initially, did not seek the kingdom of God first, but sought first the rewards of an earthly kingdom and an earthly king. During one uh, period of toleration in the early 5th century in Persia, what we now call Iran, Catholics were allowed to participate freely within the public arena and to hold public office. Uh, one such Catholic, James, was a nobleman. He's the first rank. He'd been raised by devout Christian parents. He's where, married to a very pious Catholic wife. He was honored and beloved for his virtues and his knowledge, and he'd served with great devotion and dirty, duty in the, in the Persian cavalry. As a consequence of his remarkable qualities, the king, Isidurges, had bestowed upon him so many extraordinary honors and marks of favor that James was considered first in the court. But the peaceful treatment of the Persian Catholics came to a sudden halt when a certain bishop named Abdus burnt down a very important uh, Zoroastrian temple. That infuriated the king, who responded by ordering that all Christian churches should be leveled to the ground, and that all his subjects should profess only the Zoroastrian religion. When the king declared war against Catholicism, James was so overcome with the fear of losing his property and the honors that he enjoyed at court, that not only do you not seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, instead, James completely renounced his faith, became a pagan, and joined the fire-worshipping cult. His mother and wife, both of whom were very fervent Catholics, were not present at his fall, but having heard the news, were extremely afflicted at his apostasy. They turned first to God, recommended James' soul to divine mercy, and then they wrote him a letter in which they chastised him, for having renounced the kingdom of heaven in order to please the king of Persia. I read from the letter. <clears throat> James, you have exchanged falsehood for the truth. You have abandoned the faith to obtain the praise of men and temporary rewards, which pass by like a dream and disperse like smoke. You have chosen to love a perishable and temporary kingdom, and abandoned immortality and eternity. You, who are unworthy of his love, have denied Christ in order to gain the favor of one worm-eaten man. We are greatly distressed by you and pour forth many tears. And with all our hearts, we pray you will recover and return again to godliness. And if you will not return speedily to the good path from which you have departed, know this, that we will treat you as a stranger, separate ourselves from you. We will not have any communication with one who has abandoned God to please men, to secure for himself the perishable things of this life, which will cause him to perish eternally. Well, that letter really shook James up. And tormented by the prospect of never being able to see his wife or his mother again, he began to reflect that if this rejection by his beloved wife and mother cost him so much pain, how much more would he have to fear at the hands of the eternal judge? And the prayers of those good women, and by a miracle of grace, 
He received the grace to repent from the bottom of his heart. And repent he did, no half measures. He appeared no more at court, renounced honors and worldly pleasures, and carefully avoided the company of those whom he knew might very well tempt him to fall again. And then since he had been a prominent figure, who publicly apostatized, he resolved that he needed to publicly repent, which he did by frequently saying, I'm a Christian, and I repent that I've abandoned the faith of Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. The king is soon caught wind of this and summoned James for questioning, whereupon he reproached James for his fickleness and threatened him with the most cruel death unless he immediately renounced Christ and professed his Oroastrian religion. James, remember our immeasurable friendship. I promise you, you will have wealth and power in my kingdom greater than before. Yes, my beloved and dearest friend, I entreat you to not have contempt for our great friendship and appear before me ungrateful. Because if you disobey, it is necessary, although I do not want to do so, that you be taught a lesson. But do not think I will be lenient later on. No, it is not true. I will change the love I have for you now into hatred that is commensurate with your disobedience. And I will deliver you to, to unheard of horrible torments. If you disobey, my Beloved and dear friend, dearest friend, I will deliver you to un unheard of horrible torments with friends like that who needs enemies. James replied, he's a Christian. That he sincerely repented of his apostasy and he wished him to be no longer unfaithful to the one true God. So the king commanded, in order to deter others from following that example, that James should be chopped to pieces, joint by joint, limb by limb. A large crowd gathered at the stadium in order to witness the spectacle. As the executioners tied his hands and feet, they said, Now look what your disobedience has brought upon you. We've been instructed to cut off your members one by one. If you obey the king, this can all end right now. But James was anxious to repair the scandal he had given by denying Jesus Christ. When the executioners severed James' right thumb, he said, even a vine is pruned in this manner, so that in time young branch may grow. When he cut off his second finger, he said, Receive also, Lord, the second branch of thy sowing. When he responds to his third finger being cut off, he said, I bless the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so it went, joint by joint, limb by limb, cut by cut. At each cut, as the fingers and toes and chopped off limbs piled up, James responded with scriptural verses such as, I will sing unto the Lord throughout my life. I will chant to my God for as long as I have being. May my words be sweet unto him and I will rejoice in the Lord. But when they got to the last cuts required to finally reduce his body to a mere trunk, as they cut off his legs at the hips, suddenly the pain became so great that James cried out, Christ help me. Help me. The executioners mocked him as he lay there, just a head connected to a trunk. Did we not tell you you would suffer extreme pains and torture? Ask your God to save you from these. James answered, I do not ask Christ to save me from the torments, but to strengthen me to the end, so I may win the laurel. I felt pain in order to prove that I am in the flesh. But earlier, my Lord Jesus Christ lessened my pains, and I felt nothing. And turning from his executioners to the Lord, he prayed, O oh, good Lord, hear me, half alive. Lord of the living and dead, Lord, I have no fingers to lift up to thee, no hands to lift up to thee. My feet are cut off, and my knees, so that I cannot kneel before thee. I'm like to a house fallen. The pillars have been taken away by which the house was borne up and sustained. Hear me, my Lord Jesus Christ, and take my soul from this prison. And at that, they struck off his head. He was martyred on November 27, 421. He's now known as St. James Intercesus. 
St. James and Archesis, that means St. James chopped into pieces. If, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.8, that each one of us will receive a reward according to his own labor, how great will be his reward? Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man what things God hath prepared for them that love him. There are a lot of lessons we can draw from the holy example of St. James and Archesus. Let's just consider a few. In the life of St. James and Archesus, we've seen a man who, at least initially, not only did not obey the commandment to seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, but failed miserably at it, who sought instead first the rewards of an earthly king and an earthly kingdom which shows the danger, the extreme danger of losing perspective, of limiting our view to an earthly horizon. But how common is that? How many men do we actually know whose view is not limited to an earthly horizon? In his story, we've seen the truth of the old saying, show me who your friends are, and I'll tell you where you're going. We've seen both sides of that in his story. Not only the danger, the extreme danger of worldly friends and attachment to the goods and pleasures of this world, but also the importance of holy friendships and the effect that a loving reproach can have. In a very particular way, his story shows us the truth that behind every great man there's at least one great woman. And in St. James' case, a holy wife and a holy mother. That's just as true for us as it is for you. Obvious in the first place, it pertains to Our Lady. Obviously. And for those of you that are blessed with a good wife, good sisters, a good mother, you see glimpses, refractions of Our Lady through them. For those of us that are single, it's important that we maintain uh, spiritual friendships in the first place with Our Lady, perhaps in our own families, and very typically in the cloister in heaven. I know if I've done any good in my priesthood, and I have, it's due in the first place to Our Lady, and after that, certain saints and religious women. If anyone here has read the book, In the Shadow of His Wings, you've seen a perfect example of what we're talking about here, and if you haven't read that book, you should, In the Shadow of His Wings. In his story, we've seen a beautiful example of martyrdom. Martyrs taken from the Greek word for witness. And the martyrs are amazing witnesses to the absolute importance of the holy things. It's the absolute importance of our relationship with Christ, with His Mother, with the Holy Mother Church. To the absolute importance of the truths of our faith. All these things are well worth dying for. The martyrs show us they're worth dying for, even in the most horrendous of conditions, like St. James' martyrdom. And with little reflection, we can see this martyrdom his witness teaches us that if these truths are worth dying for, and they are, then they must be worth living for. And if we take on that supernatural perspective, what a deep meaning that gives to our faith. What a profound meaning that gives to our life. Any truth that's worth dying for is worth living for. What are we willing to die for? There's more here, of course, but it'd be good for each of you to contemplate this beautiful story of the man who at first did not live according to the kingdom, but seek first the kingdom of God and his justice. The man that later received the grace to die for that. Let's ponder that scripture a little deeper. Matthew 6, I quote, Be not anxious, therefore, saying, What shall we eat? For what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the heathens seek. For your Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Seek ye therefore first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. Okay, so our Lord commands us not to worry but our temporal needs, but rather trust the Heavenly Father. Turn our focus away from the things of the world and direct 
our minds and hearts towards the things of heaven, to lift up our eyes from these earthly horizons, to seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, and then all those temporal things shall be added unto us as well. That raises two obvious questions. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? And how can each one of us tell if we're doing so? What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? And how can each one of us tell if we're doing so? In order to answer those questions, we better know what we're talking about when we speak of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? What does that mean? The Old Catholic Encyclopedia explains that the majority of Christ's preaching concerns the kingdom of God, its various aspects, its precise meaning, and the way in which it is to be obtained. According to Christ, the kingdom of God means not so much a goal to be attained or a place, although it includes those meanings. It is rather a tone of mind. It stands for an influence which must permeate men's minds if they would be one with him and attain to his ideals. The kingdom of God then means the ruling of God in our hearts. It means those principles which are opposed to and separate us from the kingdom of the world and the devil. It means the favorable influence of grace. It means the church as that divine institution whereby we may be sure of obtaining the spirit of Christ and so win that ultimate kingdom of God where he reigns without end in the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Thus the Catholic Encyclopedia. So when our Lord speaks of the kingdom of God, he's speaking of a whole group of related ideas. He's referring to a state of mind. He's referring to permeating influence in the minds of men which propel them towards unity with God and conformity to his will and the commandments. He's referring to the ruling of God in our hearts. He's referring to those principles which oppose us to and separate us from the kingdom of the world and the devil. He's referring to the favorable influence of grace. He's referring to the Catholic Church. And ultimately, he's referring to that heavenly kingdom of God where he reigns world without end. So when our Lord speaks the kingdom of God, he's referring not just to heaven, but a state of being, a way of living, thinking, speaking, acting by men who are heading towards heaven. And when he speaks of men seeking that first, he's referring to those men who have turned their focus away from the things of this world and directed their minds and hearts towards the things of heaven in the first place. He's referring to men who live with their intellects guided by truth and their wills guided by charity. To men who have truly taken to heart the scripture that the truth shall set them free. To men who are marked by an absolute devotion to truth, who strive to know and embrace the truth, no matter how painful or inconvenient it might be to them personally. To men who recognize clearly that their wills have been made to be guided by charity. That specifically Christian virtue. That supernatural power that was poured into their souls at baptism and gives them the ability to love God above all things and their neighbor as themselves for love of God. Men who also recognize clearly that their wills have been made to be guided by charity and as a result have taken to heart the scriptures that even if they should know all knowledge and have all faith, and yet have not charity, they are nothing. They recognize clearly that charity is indeed the greatest virtue. In other words, the men who are seeking first the kingdom of God and his justice are those men, and only those men, who decided to be guided by both truth and charity without counting the cost. Without counting the cost. The men who are seeking first the kingdom of God are those men, and only those men, who decide to be guided by truth and charity without counting the cost. Great French abbot Father Manuel André discussed this very point in an 1880 essay. Quote, The two great faculties of man are intelligence and will. The intelligence, being more elevated, more noble than the will, sheds light upon the will and reveals to it the object towards which it must bend. It follows that we must have an insatiable desire to know the true and the good, 
so that our will may not run the risk of going astray, inclining blindly towards an object that is not for us the true, that is not for us the good. Close quote. But how many, how many countless millions are inclining blindly towards objects that are not for them the true, that are not for them the good? In the story of St. James and Archesis, we saw a man who actually apostatized just to preserve his place in court, his honors, his riches, and his life. How many millions are inclining blithely towards objects that are not for them the true, that are not for them the good? The millions that incline blindly towards sex and various perversions. The millions who incline blindly towards drugs. The millions incline blindly towards money or power. The millions who incline blindly towards human respect and desire to fit in. The millions of guys watching porn. Twenty years ago, you could have never convinced me that in the near future, practical Catholics, guys that are still going to Mass, will be struggling with porn and carrying around a triple X movie theater in their pocket one of those so-called smartphones. And then when you told them to get rid of it, they'd fight you. It's not unusual to meet guys that are more attached to their porn than St. James was to their thumbs. It's unbelievable. Where's it getting them? That's not a stupid question. Where's it getting them? When he explained to those guys that if they try to go to confession, they can't make an honest act of contrition. Because in the act of contrition, they have to promise God, and that's in, as in God Almighty. They have to promise God they're not going to only just avoid the sin, but the near occasion of sin. As long as they're packing that near occasion of sin around their pocket, those are just empty words. They're empty words. They mean nothing. They simply can't make a valid confession unless they remove the occasion of sin. And even if a priest doesn't ask the right questions and he actually tries to absolve someone like this, that absolution only ricochets off. It has no effect. It can't have any effect because a person is living in the near occasion of sin. The man's left in his sins. And if the priest realizes what he's doing, he's just committed a sacrilege. It's insane. It's everywhere. It's like the guy that won't stop using contraception, won't finish that property with his wife. The guy who gets drunk or high, won't get rid of his booze or drugs. It's like the guy who's fornicating, won't break up with the girl. It's like the guy in a bad marriage that won't live chastely. If any of those guys go to confession, they can't make an honest act of contrition. Because in the act of contrition, they have to promise God they're not only going to avoid the sin, but the near occasion of sin. As long as they're not avoid the near occasion of sin, those are just empty words. The absolution isn't some kind of magic trick. The penitent has to have a firm purpose of amendment. Not a firm purpose to keep living right on in the near occasion of sin. It's insane and it's everywhere. Where is it getting them? These guys are more attached to their sins than St. James was to his toes. But that's not all. How common is it to find guys like us, priests or bishops, that don't actually believe the teachings of the church? Or if they do, they won't actually preach those teachings in their fullness, especially if it means it might anger some of the people in the pews. It's unbelievable. Where's it getting them? They're more attached to human respect than St. James was to his feet. How common is it to find people in the pews who place the tenets of political correctness before the teachings of Christ. How common is it to find physicians that actually won't pres prescribe uh, contraceptives? In my experience, that's all it is, but it's a lot easier to find a doctor that will do a surgical abortion than to find one that won't prescribe contraceptives. It's unbelievable. Where is it getting them? They're more attached to their careers than St. James was to his arms. Well, the pharmacists, what about the pharmacists? There's 67,000 pharmacies in this country. 
On the Pharmacists for Life website, which I checked yesterday, they list eight, which actually do not dispense any abortifacient drugs or devices, nor refer for the same. Now, there's probably more, but not that many. Where's it getting them? They're more attached to their careers than St. James was to his legs. We continue. Father Emmanuel, quote, We must have an insatiable desire to know the true and the good, so that our will may not run the risk of going astray, inclining blindly towards an object that is not for us the true, that is not for us the good. But the majority of Catholics do not have this hunger, this thirst for the truth, to which our Lord has promised eternal satisfaction. The majority of Catholics do not have this hunger, this thirst for the truth to which our Lord has promised eternal satisfaction. However little a Catholic like this knows, he always thinks that he knows enough, if not too much. Listening to a sermon is for him a spiritual luxury. He knows his prayers, or at least he thinks he does. Is that not enough? He can say to God, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but he has not the slightest wish to know how the divine will is done in heaven nor what is needed in order that it likewise be done on earth. We have Christians that have spent 80 years without learning anything, and arriving at the end of their span are no wiser than they were at the beginning of it. He's writing in 1880. For such Christians, prayer is a routine, confession, another routine, and communion, yet another routine. Prayer for them is something one says. Confession means speaking and hearing someone else speak. Communion is receiving the sacramental species without saying anything. These acts are carried out as pure formalities. Nothing supernatural in the thoughts or affections. No care for the grace of God. No yearning after eternal goods. And after the most holy acts of his religion, the Christian remains what he was before. A man turned, as it were, into stone. For many Catholics who are still practicing, prayer is a routine, mass is a routine, communion is another routine. They just shuffle up automatically without anything supernatural in their thoughts. No concern for the grace of God without yearning for eternity. They're growing through the motions. I come from ranch country in Montana. I'm sorry to say, but in my experience, uh, the Mass in all too many parishes that that I've been in reminds me of a sorting pen where you're working livestock. All kinds of cattle milling about, balling, um, carrying on. As a fundamentalist friend of mine once told me after having tapped attended a pretty typical Mass with me back home. I said, look, Phil, I'm not talking about you, but I don't believe for a minute those people never believe what you say they believe. Because if they did, they wouldn't act the way they do. If I believed that little host was God, I'd be on my face. I sure wouldn't be acting like them. What could I say? It was true. Actions speak louder than words. Which is why we can say there's absolutely no way that most of the people in such situations, and I include in a particular manner the priest, there's absolutely no way that most of the people in such circumstances show any evidence of actually believing in any meaningful way in the real presence. Actions speak louder than words. We continue, Father Emmanuel, quote, It belongs to man's dignity and to Christian duty to know what he is doing and to know it well. It was to this end that God has given us reason, faith, and the commandments. The Christian who truly lives the gospel knows that. This is why he never ceases asking God for light from on high to guide his steps. At the same time, he asks God for his help, without which he can neither discern his goal nor reach it. And he makes on his own part continual efforts seeking to grow in the knowledge of God and his duties. And lest he should falter in the holy desire for light and the hunger and thirst for eternal truth, the church is there to teach all truth. The pastor's first duty is to give all the instruction that is so necessary to all. And the church that resounds in the great voice of the first pope, crying to all Christians, quote, Grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, close quote, 2 Peter 3.18. Before all else, the church's mission is to teach. Going, teach you, says the Savior. Close quotes, Father Emmanuel. Before all else, the church's mission is to teach, and the pastor's first duty is to give all the instruction that is so necessary to all. 
Well, in that department, we're not doing so hot these days, are we? As Cardinal Burke has pointed out, quote, there's been a gravely defective catechesis in the United States for several decades, which has left adults and young people ill-equipped to defend the truth of the moral law. There's also been a tendency for the church to be timid regarding its solemn duty to defend the truth in the public forum, close quote. Well, there sure has been a gravely defective catechesis, and it's only getting worse. It's moved from the pulpits and the classrooms and the chanceries, and now even the Holy See. We have to be particularly careful these days since there's a lot of confusion pouring out at every level in the church. At a retreat last fall with Cardinal Burke, which the pastor was present also, I met him there, he gave some excellent advice in response to a question about the Pope. Quote, I am somewhat disoriented myself. We know what the church teaches. We have the catechism and the magisterium. We just stick with that and remain serene. These things don't change. We have the magisterium and tradition. We all know good priests. Keep that in mind. Also the great saints like St. John Fisher remain serene about it. We must remain serene. The important thing is to not get angry. You must guard against anger. Keep yourself well informed as to the teaching of the church. This turmoil will not last. First of all, it is not of God. Second of all, the big proponents of it, God will take care of with nature. Don't be discouraged. Be of good courage. It is important to remain serene. Thus, Cardinal Burke. If we're truly seeking and striving to seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, then keeping our serenity, or learning how to keep our serenity, is essential. Even when things are in great turmoil on the outside, we should strive to keep a calm, beautiful place within our heart and the depths of our soul. The devil works in stormy waters, but if we keep our peace, it's much easier to discern which spirit is working on us at any one time. A couple of pieces of advice to that end. Say a rosary every day. Every day. No exceptions. There's a great little book by Father Jacques Philippe entitled Searching for and Maintaining Your Peace. Searching for and Maintaining Your Peace, Father Jacques Philippe. Read it, reread it, read it prayerfully. Searching for and Maintaining Your Peace, Father Jacques Philippe. Wean yourself off disordered music. If you have a habit of listening to disordered music, wean yourself off. If you're going to wean yourself off, don't just go cold turkey. That usually doesn't work that good. Go to Baroque music, listen to that for several months till you get, till you, uh, get those passions more ordered. And then be very observant as what's going on with your passions as you slowly introduce other music. Minimize your contact with the media. Be very careful about keeping up with what passes for political and religious news. Can you imagine Our Lady and St. Joseph constantly keeping, trying to keep up with the latest shenanigans of the Roman Emperor, the procreator of Judea, or the High Priest? Basically, stick to your duties in your state of life. If you hear something scandalous, crazy, or concerning, about one of the leaders in church or state, say another decade of the rosary for him. Put it out of your mind and be about your business. Do your duties and stay alive. Say your rosary. Live the message of Fatima. If you need to look something up, there are plenty of good catechisms available. We need especially to keep some perspective in terms of the chaos the Holy See, as there is a clear and pleasant danger for good Catholics to scandalize themselves. To that end, we'll consider some thoughtful comments that were written by Frank Sheed during the ter terrible chaos that followed the Council. And I quote, In the criticisms uttered by many, there's a failure to see Christ as the whole point. So much in the daily running of the church they find oppressing. The sermons they say take no one deeper into the reality of God or man. This priest or that cares for nothing but money. The sick are neglected, the older rejected. The hierarchy know nothing of the emotional, intellectual problems which are eating away at the people's faith. The courier is simply a bureaucracy using every trick to hold on to its power. As for the Pope, it all adds up to the institutional church, with so many wondering if their spiritual integrity will permit them to remain in it. But institutional Israel, the chosen people, as the prophet showed, was even worse than the harshest critics think the Catholic Church. Yet it never occurred to the holies, to the Jews, to leave it. They knew that however evilly the administration behaved, Israel was still the people of God. So with the church. An administration is necessary if the church is to function, but Christ is the whole point of the functioning. We're not baptized into the hierarchy. 
We do not receive the cardinals sacramentally. We will not spend eternity in the beatific vision of the Pope. St. John Fisher could say in a public sermon, if the Pope will not reform the Curia, God will. A couple of years later, he laid his head on Henry VIII's block for papal supremacy. Followed the same block by St. Thomas More, who had spent his youth under the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI, lived his early manhood under the Medici Pope, Leo X, and died for papal supremacy under Clement VII, as time-serving a pope as Rome had had. Christ is the point. I myself admire the present pope, at the time it's Paul VI, but even if I criticize as harshly as some do, even if his successor proved to be as bad as some of those who have gone before, even if I sometimes find the church as I have to live in it, a pain in the neck, I should still say that nothing a pope could do or say would make me wish to leave the church, though I might well wish that he would. Israel, through its best periods as through its worst, preserved the truth of God's oneness in a world swarming with gods, and the sense of God's majesty in a world sick with its own pride. So with the church. Under the worst administration, say as bad as John the Twelfth a thousand years ago, we could still learn Christ's truth, still receive his life in the sacraments, still be in union with him to the limit of our willingness. Close quote. Nothing a pope could say or do would make me wish to leave the church. Under the worst administration, we could still learn Christ's truth, still receive his life in the sacraments, still be in union with him to the limit of our willingness. Christ is the point. Let's keep our perspective. Christ is the point. Okay, now let's take a little more careful look at the absolute necessity of living in the truth in order to, to make to attain union with Christ. If he's the point, then that's who we're striving for union with. To this end, we'll read from a commentary on that specific topic. This is written uh, for nuns before the council. Quote, since God is truth, <clears throat> union of the soul with God will depend on the degree to which the soul recognizes the truth and is willing to sacrifice all things for the truth. Since God is truth, union of the soul with God will depend on the degree to which the soul recognizes the truth and is willing to sacrifice all things for the truth. Love for God can be equated with love for the truth. Close quote. Is this not the lesson of St. James and her Jesus? Is this not the lesson of the martyrs? Everyone needs to burn that into his mind. Since God is truth, Union of the soul with God will depend on the degree to which the soul recognizes the truth and is willing to sacrifice all things for the truth. Love for God can be equated with love for the truth. We continue. In view of this clearly understood fact, it is staggering that religious can play with the truth for their own satisfaction when God has plainly designed the human intellect for the search for truth for him. Anyone seeking God needs tremendous honesty, and it is very rare. He's writing to religious, but applies to everyone. It is staggering that anyone can play with the truth for his own satisfaction when God has plainly designed the human intellect for the search for truth for him. Anyone seeking God needs tremendous honesty, and it is very rare. It is difficult to be honest. Feel the bigness required for the virtue of honesty. Whether the dishonesty is conscious or unconscious, it prevents the progress of the soul to God. This is another reason it's important to study our holy religion. Whether the dishonesty is conscious or unconscious, it prevents the progress of the soul to God. Since God can neither deceive nor be deceived, it is against God's nature to build on a lie. What we believe really matters. Since God can neither deceive nor be deceived, it is against God's nature to build on a lie. Unless the nun, unless anyone sees things as they are, rather than as she wants them to be, God, by giving her the grace she seeks, will be building on error. Genuine goodwill depends on honesty, a simple love for the truth, regardless of how much it pleases or displeases her. That's worth emphasizing. 
Genuine goodwill depends on honesty, a simple love for the truth, regardless of how much it pleases or displeases her. We see in that first night sky of Bethlehem, what were the angels singing? Peace on earth to men of good will. Not peace on earth to good men. Peace on, men, on earth to men of good will. Good will, a simple love for the truth. And we see a concrete example of that with the Magi. These are Zoroastrians. Astrology leads them to Christ. And then the Gospel tells us they went back by a different route. Of course, in the first instance, it means they took a different trail because Herod was looking for them. But the spiritual meaning, they were brought to Christ by astrology, then they were confronted with the truth, and they left it. And at what cost? Later on, we know they're martyrs. The Cologne Cathedral is where their relics are. St. Thomas the Apostle uh, consecrated them bishops. But what cost? Genuine goodwill depends on honesty, a simple love for the truth, regardless of how much it pleases or displeases her. Honesty is a virtue by which the child sees that she deserved the spanking. The loose woman admits that she brought her troubles on herself. The drunk confesses that no one else poured the whiskey down his throat. Honesty is the virtue by which the religious sees that only she can stand in the way of God's work in her soul, by which she refuses to lay her failures at the door of persecution, misunderstanding, poor preparation for whatever happens, or any of the countless forms of self-justification. Honesty is the virtue by which she searches her soul for the obstacles to grace, wishing to find them regardless of their unpleasantness. The main stimulus to honesty is the prospect of its rewards, which make the pain involved both acceptable and reasonable. Honesty is the shortest route to truth, that is to say, God. Honesty is the shortest route to God. The goal is reached through the battle of the soul, against slavery to self. The truth which makes men free liberates them from the emotional clamor for the immediate physical good, that which is seen, tasted, touched, heard, and smelled. It raises them above the senses, where the prize of true love awaits the truly free. And for the honest religious, unenchanted by herself, there awaits the greatest love of all, the love of God. Close quote. Now how common is this sort of honesty? Don't worry about thinking about anyone else. Look in your own heart. Do you have a simple love for the truth, regardless of how much it pleases or displeases you? It is staggering that anyone can play with the truth for his own satisfaction when God has plainly designed the human intellect for the search for truth, the search for Him. Anyone seeking God needs tremendous honesty, and it is very rare. Whether dishonesty is conscious or unconscious, it prevents the progress of the soul to God. Since he can neither deceive nor be deceived, it's against God's nature to build on a lie. Unless someone sees things as they are, rather than as he wants them to be, God, by giving him the grace he seeks, would be building on error. Genuine goodwill depends on honesty, a simple love for the truth, regardless of how much it pleases or displeases him. Look in your own heart. Do you have a simple love for the truth, regardless of how much it pleases or displeases you? Look in your heart. Because there's a flip side. There's a flip side, and it's terrifying. It's bone chilling. In May of 1897, Pope Leo XIII stated in his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, quote, Whosoever faileth by weakness or ignorance may perhaps have some excuse before Almighty God. But he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. Close quote. He who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. We're all familiar with that terrifying statement of our Lord. It's found in Mark 3.29. Quote, He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall never have forgiveness, but shall be guilty of an everlasting sin. Close quote. Resisting the truth is one of the sins against the Holy Ghost. And I quote from a standard Catholic reference work, quote, In particular, deliberate resistance to the known truth may be regarded as specially directed against the work of the Holy Ghost in the soul. Generally, this so hardens the soul to the inspirations of grace that repentance is unlikely. Close quote. Back to Leo XIII. 
Whosoever faileth by weakness or ignorance may perhaps have some excuse before Almighty God, but he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. In our days, this sin has become so frequent. He's writing in 1897. In our days, this sin has become so frequent that those dark times seem to have come which were foretold by St. Paul, which men, blinded by the just judgment of God, shall take falsehood for truth and shall believe in the prince of this world, who is a liar and the father thereof is a teacher of truth. As it says in 2 Thessalonians 2.10 and 1 Timothy 4.1, God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying. In the last time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to spirits of error, the doctrines of devils. Close quote, the vicar of Christ. So it's pretty much cut and dry. We have two basic choices. Either we love the truth, or we'll end up loving the lie. Either we love the truth or we'll end up loving a lie. How many of us here really love the truth? Look in your heart. Be brutally honest with yourself. Do you have a simple love for the truth, regard of how much it pleases or displeases you? Now let's ask the other question. Which kingdom do I customarily live in? The kingdom of the world or the kingdom of God? Remember that when our Lord speaks of the kingdom of God, he's referring not just to heaven, but to a state of being, a way of living, thinking, speaking, acting by men who are heading towards heaven. When he speaks of men seeking that first, he's referring to those men who have turned their focus away from the things of the world, direct their minds and hearts towards the things of heaven. He's referring to men who live with their intellects guided by truth and wills guided by charity, who have truly taken to heart the scripture that the truth will set them free who are marked by an absolute devotion to truth, who strive to know and embrace truth, no matter how much it might cost them personally. Men who also recognize clearly that their wills have been made to be guided by charity, that specifically Christian supernatural power that was poured in their souls at baptism gives them the ability to love God above all things and their neighbor as themselves for love of God. And as a result of recognizing that, they've also taken truly to heart the scriptures that even if they should have all knowledge and have all faith, yet have not charity, they are nothing. In other words, men that are seeking first the kingdom of God as justice are those men and only those men who decided to be guided by truth and charity without counting the cost. Now once we see all that, it's easy to, to tell whether we're seeking first the kingdom of God. There are any number of questions we can ask ourselves. Do I esteem of all things God and his will, his commandments, his desires, his love? Is that first in my life? Is that truly the center of what I am and what I desire? Do I truly see the spiritual and eternal things as priceless and temporal goods of relatively small value and something only to be sought after in subordination to the kingdom of God as things which are added by God so far as they contribute to my real good? Where do I focus my attention? Are my time and money spent primarily on things that will certainly perish or in the service of God? Am I a Catholic on Sunday and American the rest of the week? Or have I truly surrendered all aspects of my life to Christ and His church? Can I honestly say, Lord, I want to accomplish Thy will more than I want to follow my will? In my studies, in my day-to-day -day life, in my personal affairs, in my dealing with my neighbors, do I truly desire to know the truth? Not just convenient and free truths, but all the truths proper for my state and life, no matter how painful or inconvenient they might be for me personally. Am I careful to re reject and resist political correctness in all its forms? Do I recognize clearly that political correctness is at its root a way of using words and ideas, not as means of containing truth, but rather as ex of expressions of what's acceptable and not acceptable to say and believe in polite company, so to speak. A person who buys into the whole notion of political correctness uh, changes or adopts his ideas like a woman in Hollywood changes their clothing styles. It's really a question of what's in fashion. But the reason to believe things is not because they're fashionable. The reason to believe things is because they're true. Do I have a simple love for the truth? Because we're all well aware of the names we get called uh, if we don't bind to some politically correct position, let your nose be viewed, your views be known, you know, you're judgmental, you're fascist, misogynist, uh, you know, fundamentalist, blah, blah, blah. 
These labels are all designed to humiliate the person so they'll shut up, get on with the program. The point here is political correctness is based on using two fundamental desires to control people, desire to be accepted and the fear of being rejected. Those who succumb to the pressures are very much like James when he apostatized because of his desire to remain pleasing the king. And those who resist are very much like James when he repented because of his desire to be pleasing to God. Where am I? Do I have a simple love for the truth? My day-to-day -day life, my personal affairs, my dealing with my neighbors. Is charity my overriding concern? Are my thoughts, words, and acts measured against something else? Do I adjust my thoughts, words, and acts to make things more convenient for me? To increase my popularity, to increase my wealth or political advantage? Do I adjust my thoughts, words, and acts uh, to gain power, to increase my pleasure? Where do I focus my attention? Is charity my overriding concern? No matter how painful or inconvenient it might be for me personally. When one truly has charity, he no longer has his own agenda. No matter what the cross is, he wants only what's true because he wills what God wills. He no longer says in his heart, my kingdom come, but rather, thy kingdom come. Okay, now given all that, and assuming that even, even if each one of us here is not quite there yet, that still each one of us here does want to seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, that each one of us does really want to be guided by truth and charity without cutting the cost, let's close with a, slow, a short reflection. Each one of us should look in his heart with brutal honesty. Maybe we, like St. James, have failed. Maybe we've divided our Lord. Maybe we've fallen short. We've succumbed to political correctness, failed in our marriage commitments, fallen into contraception or sexual activity outside marriage, fallen in struggles with perverse lifestyles or porn, maybe seriously failed in our duties in our state and life, our witness to Christ, our involvement with immoral wars or crooked business deals or dishonest politics, maybe criminal behavior, drunkenness, drug abuse, Maybe we've been making bad confessions, sacrilegious communions. Whatever the case might be, it's time to repent. It's time to repent and reject anything and everything that's not pleasing to God. It's time to seek first the kingdom of God and His justice. It's time to be guided by both truth and charity without counting the cost. It's time to become faithful witnesses to the truth. It's time to become faithful witness to the truth on a daily basis. It's time to become faithful witnesses to the truth incarnate on a daily basis. It's time to join ranks of St. James and her Jesus and all the holy martyrs. Be faithful witnesses to truth incarnate on a daily basis in all the circumstances of our lives. That's martyrdom on the installment plan. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added unto you.